Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good day to everyone. First of all, I would like to uh, give my, my highest appreciation to the maze for inviting me to share about uh, today's topic, Underwater Acoustic Sensor Design and Application. I'm Ikhwan from University Pendidikan Sultan Idris, representing IEEE Oceanic Engineering Society, Malaysian chapter. So, uh, without any further ado, let's dip in into our topics today. Okay, so... Let's go to a part one, which is... Uh, I would like to talk a little bit on underwater acoustic fundamentals. That is quite important for us uh, before talking uh, or go a, a bit deeper on a sensor design and its application. So, uh, we all know that sounds travel at different speeds depending on what type of medium uh, they are using to, to, to transfer. So, for uh, underwater or simply uh, submerged application, normally we agree on uh, one single value which is 1500 meter per second. So, that's the speed of sound for the measurement. Uh, it is all we, we always use this value to design a sensor we always use this value as a reference before calibration uh, and so on unless uh, we really want to uh, go very very uh, for very precision applications then we need to recalculate the sound um, uh, velocity the speed of sound in water using a specific velocimeter or other uh, specialized instruments. So, uh, when we design a sensor, it is very important for us to first determine what type of applications uh, we want to use it because when uh, for underwater acoustics, it is really uh, uh, frequency dependent. For example, we can, we can see here for a seismic uh, application, we are the, the tendency to use uh, the frequency below one kilohertz because of a uh, wavelength is a uh, way more uh, longer uh, and it is suitable for seismic application while for side scan sonar for example uh, normally the sensor will be operate uh, between 110 kilohertz to 700 kilohertz uh, so it's all depends on what type of application you want to use so the in uh, for underwater acoustics world there is no such thing one sensor that fits many application normally we use a single sensor for single application for example uh, we can uh, uh, the, the easiest example we can benchmark is a fish finding sonar this is a, a consumer products that can be that are very popular today nowadays for recreational fishermen and recreational fishing. Uh, for a single uh, fish finder or, or echo sounder, uh, uh, a user can uh, choose uh, between two, two or three types of different transducers. It depends on what type of, of application of user wants. For example, uh, a traditional sonar will be operated at 80 kilohertz while a uh, chirp sonar will be operated at 200 kilohertz and uh, uh, a triple beam or triple triple shot uh, sonar will be operated as well as uh, as high as uh, 700 kilohertz so for for a different applications the user need to use a different type of sensor using the same electronics so nowadays the the sensor selection has become uh, uh, more more we, we we can we we can have uh, so many variation of sensors for one single unit of sonar so it is uh, quite interesting for us to discuss about this topic because uh, the demand and uh, the market share for underwater acoustic sensors has increasing uh, year by year and the the size and the form factor of the sensor as well uh, going smaller and smaller so people nowadays are looking for a small uh, sensor and a small transducer for a very demanding uh, high precision application. So talking about sonar uh, or underwater acoustics, 
uh, we have uh, the same dilemma for the past uh, 80 to 19 years, uh, uh, which is normally we use a very high frequency because we want to achieve a high resolution. That's it. That's the only reason why we use a high frequency. Uh, uh, but um, uh, according to a thought formula, a high frequency will result in, uh, of course, a higher resolution and you will sacrifice the distance as well. So high frequency, you get your resolution, but you lose your distance. Talking about low frequency, you of course, you can achieve better distance, but at a lower resolution. But, and and, and uh, furthermore, the, the size of the transducer will be getting bigger as well. So it, these are the dilemma that uh, has been around for underwater acoustic sensor designers uh, for so many years. And normally we increase the intensity of the sound pressure level to improve a penetration, but it will require, of course, a high voltage and you need uh, a bigger power module to operate uh, uh, the sonar. So uh, normally uh, a fish finder, eh, a fish finder for uh, industrial fishing use around uh, 300 watts of power. So this is a uh, quite amount of energy uh, for a penetration of around 200 meters of water uh, especially when uh, when the vessel or the, uh, the the platform is not so big so the, the power consumption will be a big issue so this is where the uh, micro module uh, sensors uh, are getting more popular because they are using uh, less power and consume less power compared to their traditional counterpart so now let's have a look at the anatomy of the sensor so the, the sensors normally consist of two two parts which is uh, the first part is a mechanical part this is a mechanical part and this is an electrical part so it is important for us as a designer or at least want, uh, if we want to the if we want to understand uh, how the underwater acoustic sensors operate we need to combine both we need to understand both uh, the mechanical part as well as the electrical part so uh, in order to uh, to dig in into the into these particular topics of uh, underwater acoustic sensor design uh, we need to deal with so many materials Okay. For example, we have uh, encapsulation materials here. We have uh, active materials inside here uh, where the energy conversion happens. We have uh, so many circuitry back here. And at the back here, we have a different type of uh, uh, housing material. You have a couple of materials over here. You have a protection materials over here. You have a sacrificial anode here. And so uh, the, the point is that material properties are always the key so you need we, we really need to understand the material properties and what type of properties really need or really want to use uh, to be used for underwater acoustic sensor design secondly uh, what type of transduction mechanism that will take place in your sensor because the energy conversion is uh, from the electrical energy to the mechanical energy that's it so sound is all about vibration it's all about producing or, or, or vibrating the medium uh, from point uh, from point a to point b so a uh, sound is actually a mechanical vibration so the the energy conversion that must occur inside uh, and under uh, an uh, acoustic sensor including underwater acoustic sensor is that uh, in order to operate in a transmitting mode uh, uh, the energy, the electrical energy, need to be converted into a mechanical or vibration uh, energy, while in op while, while operating in a receiving mode, uh, uh, the energy conversion occurs in a reverse way, which is the input will be the uh, vibration and the output will be the electrical. There are so many types of electroacoustic transduction, but we only uh, today, with a short period of time uh, given, we will only be uh, focusing on the piezoelectric transduction mechanism. It is very popular. It is a very uh, fairly and comparatively easier to understand compared to other electroacoustic transduction mechanism and and uh, the third things we need to discover today is about vibration issues so when we induce the vibration or uh, 
it's all about the the structure integrity it's all about the the uh, how do you prolong the life of your senses because when it's all when it's involved a vibration is just just like our cars uh, uh, when it constantly vibrate every day uh, the wear and tear will be there so it's uh, the, the 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 science behind the design of your transducer must also include uh, the uh, how, how do we prolong the lifespan of our transducer because it will be operated under a constant vibration day by day year by year okay so the material properties uh, uh, that include the uh, mechanical properties of the materials the chemical properties of the materials electrical properties of the materials as well as the thermal properties of the materials but we are not going to 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 make this uh, like a, 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 a material science lecture but uh, the chemical properties will have something to do with a corrosion because when you put uh, uh, when, when you put a material uh, uh, in a water especially a seawater that is very highly corrosive with uh, sometimes the, the salinity will be very very high especially in an in the eastern part of the Malaysia where the salinity is very high compared to the west coast of the peninsula Malaysia so corrosion in seawater water requires uh, the the, the uh, the selection of material uh, uh, we, we might need a different material for a housing if we want to use uh, the sensors for the East Coast uh, and we might need another type of material for housing if we want to constantly use it on the West Coast of our trans of, of our peninsula Malaysia so that that's the the idea behind uh, the chemical properties of a material so uh, why why do uh, why it is uh, so important because we don't want to keep changing the housing of our sensors year by year because by changing the housing of the, the of, of, of our sensor it will also include uh, or uh, it will also affect the uh, uh, the efficiency of the energy transduction and sound transmission from the transducer to the body of the water so uh, constant threat uh, about seawater uh, this is during and after operation and sometimes uh, uh, we want to take out our transducers from the water so we don't want to uh, to use a material that require a constant uh, maintenance yeah, to, to, to provide from corrosion so for avoiding corrosion we have so many uh, particular ways so many uh, so many existing ways uh, for example we can use a protective layer and paint but uh, we all need to to be sure ab uh, about this decision because most of the protective layer and paint uh, out there uh, uh, are, not, uh, are not environmental friendly and it's become uh, a threat to our coral and to the um, marine uh, living living uh, creatures as well uh, we might need a sacrificial anode, but uh, just now we are talking about le uh, about a very limited power sources on board of the vessel. So sacrificial anode will also requires uh, an additional electrical uh, connection. So we might need a smart material. Uh, in this case, we would like to we we, we will uh, reveal of, uh, maybe a few materials that might be. Uh, mind-blowing or maybe uh, 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 suitable uh, as an alternative to a protective layer in paint uh, as well as a sacrificial anode so next is a biofouling biofouling also uh, is not a big issue but when it is there uh, it will affect the performance of your underwater acoustic sensors because we all know that the biofouling will will, will uh, form a, a film uh, outside of your uh, sensor housing and of course when uh, there, there is, when, when there is something in between your sensor and your medium then the transmission loss will occur so acoustically by your fouling will reduce the sensor performance by uh, it will be reflecting back the acoustic signals that should be uh, transmitted and the scattered projected sound closing acoustic window as well as a blocking transmission during a receiving mode so chemically biofouling can also change the ph around sensors and produce hydrochloric acid to increase corrosion rate so if 
you found a, a biofouling on the surface of your sensor, you might need to consider to remove it as soon as possible because your sensor, the surface of your sensor, will be corroded more, uh, a lot faster when there is a biofouling present. So, uh, uh, so how, how to counter? Of course, regular maintenance as well as we might need a special material. So in this uh, particular uh, uh, discussion, we will be suggesting to use a, a cuprum alloy uh, or so-called a sea bronze in order to uh, not also not, not only reduce the corrosion but also but also as an active prevention uh, to delay the biofouling uh, formation on the surface of the sensor. So these are the examples of biofouling just in case you are wondering what type what is a biofouling. So uh, can you imagine if a sensor with this kind of uh, with this kind of, of obstruction at the wave front uh, of the sensor. Uh, so the performance will be uh, drastically reduced if you have uh, this kind of biofouling. So I am I am not really worried about the uh, uh, use and go or day-to-day -day applications such as uh, underwater uh, underwater acoustic sauna for fish finder, for uh, range finding, uh, because uh, it's constantly moving. But for a specific application such as uh, monitoring buoy, uh, where you need to leave your sensors for so many uh, so many days or maybe uh, a few months or maybe years then the chances for the biofouling to form on top of your sensors will be a bit higher. So in that particular case, you might need to consider either a passive uh, way to block a biofouling or maybe uh, uh, active way. Uh, so electrical and thermal properties. So I, I am uh, considering that you guys might be very familiar with this one. So. Uh, let's skip this one as well as this one. So mechanical properties, why it is so important? Because uh, just now we are talking about vibration. So we don't want our material to vibrate uh, more than what it can uh, sustain. So we, we don't want to provide a, a, a voltage or excitation, excitation voltage uh, way uh, bigger than what it can, uh, what it, it should uh, uh, operate. Uh, because it will force the transducers uh, to the uh, to uh, to a strain uh, to, to 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 a mechanical strain, especially on the surface. Okay, now let next let's move on to the electroacoustic transduction, uh, which is the most important part. Of our sensors so for the electroacoustic uh, transduction this is where the energy conversions occur okay. uh, what is energy conversion yeah just now we are talking about uh, sensors the the, the, the the function of uh, acoustic sensor is to form or uh, is to transform electrical energy into uh, a mechanical energy or a vice vice versa so uh, what happened inside this electroacoustic transduction Almost uh, everything, uh, the, the performance of the sensors will be determined uh, by electroacoustic transduction. For example, if you choose, if we choose uh, electrostrictive uh, or magnetostrictive uh, electroacoustic transduction, we all knew that the efficiency of the uh, magnetic coil cannot be more than forty-five percent. So this is what it meant by uh, it will determine the overall sensor performance. So uh, we all knew that if we choose uh, the piezoelectric uh, uh, transduction mechanism, uh, the efficiency can be as high as ninety-three percent. So, uh, uh, however, the, the 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 efficiency is not the only factor. Uh, sometimes the availability of the material, the form factor of the uh, application, and many more, or maybe uh, the, the the final frequency that might be produced by the transducer. So uh, uh, lately, we have a, a new form of electroacoustic transduction mechanism, which is an electro optoacoustic uh, transduction mechanism. So in this newly developed uh, electroacoustic transduction, it will involve the uh, optical part 
where uh, the fiber optic will be part of the sensors. So why we are using uh, or people start choosing uh, fiber optics because just because of uh, the, the, the speed of the transmission of light uh, in a shorter uh, distance is way faster than the uh, sounds travel. Uh, so uh, uh, for a very specific application such as a short range underwater acoustic modem, uh, they are start using uh, electro opto acoustic transduction mechanism. So the energy conversion is between electrical and mechanical. So we have two modes of operation for our acoustic transducers. Uh, in a transmit mode, the energy conversion uh, is from electrical to mechanical and in receive mode this from a mechanical to an electrical. So this is what we call an energy conversion. And the energy conversion only happens inside the transduction mechanism. So we have at least six uh, elect, uh, transduction mechanism here. We have electrostrictive mechanism. We have a variable reluctance mechanism, electrostatic mechanism. We can also use a magnetostrictive mechanism. So all of these four is nonlinear mechanism and require polariz polarization and constant voltage bias. Uh, so for, uh, on, on the left part is a body force transducers and the right part is a surface force transducers. So we have all, we, we also have a linear mechanism, which is a lot more easier to uh, comparatively uh, to, to handle and to develop. So either using moving coil, if we want it as a surface force transducers, or we can choose a piezoelectric if we want it as a body force transducers. So body force transducers, uh, uh, the, the simplest way to define it is uh, uh, the the the, uh, the whole uh, body of the transistors will be utilized to to convert the energy uh, compared to the surface force transistors, whereas only partial or maybe the top or bottom part of the transistors will be used to transfer the energy. So uh, today we are, we are, will be talking about piezoelectrics more compared to other transduction mechanism because it is simply the best and the most efficient way to convert electrical energy to uh, uh, acoustic energy as well as uh, to convert uh, acoustic energy to uh, uh, electrical energy. So piezoelectrics is a very versatile uh, transduction mechanism So the, the, as well as the, the materials uh, has been discovered for so many years. So uh, in this part, let's talk about the piezoelectric transduction mechanism. So extensively used for its superior conversion efficiency, of course, uh, it is a linear uh, not so linear, but it, it can be considered as linear. Robustness compared to other uh, mechanisms such as a moving coil. You, when, when you have a coil, it will become a very sensitive and will be less robust. However, uh, even though the piezoelectric transduction is quite robust, uh, if, you, if we are using the ceramic-based uh, piezoelectric material, it is not so robust eh? we be, we, because uh, we are we all know that the ceramic is uh, popular for a quite brittle material so you you cannot see uh, once you drop your your transducers it will be gone so compact compatible with cmos technology of course you can have your built-in circuitry inside your sensors by using piezoelectric mechanism uh, it is chemically inert and unaffected by humidity comparatively to other a transduction mechanism. So piezoelectric materials, you can all, you, you can have two options. Eh? We always have two options of piezoelectric materials. Either you want to use, we want to use a natural piezoelectric or activated piezoelectric. For me personally, I'm very happy and I'm very pleased to use activated piezoelectric material, even though it is uh, uh, a little bit more expensive compared to a natural piezoelectric such as quartz, tourmaline, or roselle, short, uh, roselle salt. Uh, uh, simply because activated piezoelectric materials, even though it requires uh, uh, a high voltage polling process, it has or uh, it carries way higher piezoelectricity compared to a natural piezoelectric materials. And when we are talking about polling, when we pull it, of course, it will be a reverse pole uh, or maybe the aging process. So you cannot have your transducers 
that will be that will last along for 40 or 60 years because uh, of the polling process so it will uh, reverse back to its original condition uh, after a certain period of time however the the uh, we can uh, we can pull it uh, in the middle or maybe uh, at the middle of the service life of the transducers. So do not worry about uh, reverse polling. So uh, activated piezoelectric that includes piezoelectric ceramics. We have so many options on the market. We have a zinc oxide. So we have also uh, uh, aluminum nitride, lead niobic, and a polymeric based uh, material such as PVDF. So all of these materials are so popular because of, simply because of it is uh, comparable and uh compatible with uh mems process so you can use a thin film deposition process you can use a thin film uh a cmos process for this cut this this type of material and these are the enablers of the p mute technology so p mute is actually piezoelectric micro machine ultrasonic transducers so we we uh uh, by using all the all the activated piezoelectric uh, materials, people are now can force or can can shrink the size of the uh, ultrasonic transducers into a very small scale. So, aging piezoelectric is not a big issue, but as a designer, we need to understand this because piezoelectric properties change with time, exponent with time after the polling process. So, whenever you buy, whenever we we buy the piezoelectric disc. Uh, from the shelf, we need to know the 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 date, the exact date of the uh, or the polling date of that particular material. So the longer the period of time after polling, the more stable the material becomes, and um, and the aging uh, rate affecting dielectric constant. It will also affect the piezoelectric constant and coupling coefficient as well. So the aging rate depends on the ceramic composition. It depends on the geometry and shape. As well as the manufacturing process and of your ceramic disc or of your piezoelectric or activated piezoelectric material so aging rate increase if constantly under high mechanical stress strong electric field and high temperature this is why we always want to operate or to or to, to really plan the storage of our transducers um, pretty well because it will uh, affect uh, the quality of the uh, activated piezoelectric materials inside your sensors. So uh, every sensor has a limitation. Of course, we have a temperature limitation. Uh, we all know that piezoelectric material can uh, efficiently work below Curie temperature. So we cannot operate uh, uh, the transducers above or uh, one third near to the Curie temperature. Uh, for ceramic materials, it is not so worrying because the Curie temperature is relatively high compared to a polymeric uh, piezoelectric material such as a PVDF. Eh? PVDF, for example, uh, have a 100 degree uh, Celsius Curie temperature. So when we operate at a high frequency, for example, uh, somewhere or above 80 degree Celsius, we all, the, 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 the performance of the piezoelectric of the PVDF will be uh, will be compromised. So the Curie temperature is unique for each material, and in practice operates as lower than half of the Curie material uh, temperature is the safest uh, rule of thumb okay, for the uh, uh, underwater acoustic sensors. For, for example, if we are if we are using PVDF as our piezoelectric material. So the maximum working print, working uh, temperature is should be below 50 degree Celsius. So voltage limitation also, also an issue. We, we normally or we rarely uh, force our transducers uh, into a high voltage uh, or more than the operating voltage because it will affect the polarization of the uh, material as well as the mechanical stress limitation. Uh, this is where uh, uh, we always make a mistake. So simply put, because of it is an underwater acoustic sensor, you just uh, we all just uh, 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 submerge it in the water without knowing that there is a limitation uh, of the working depth of that particular sensor. For example, a sensor might come with a five meter operating depth. If we operate that sensor at a twenty meter operating depth, it will put 
uh, very mechanical uh, the, the sensor is in a, a mechanical stress so it will uh, might collapse the membrane structure inside the uh, inside that particular sensors so this is uh, piezoelectricity i think we might skip this uh, this uh, topics because it will become a physics lecture if we continue this but understanding piezoelectric properties uh, it's not that difficult so we just need to understand about several uh, parameters for example d constant g constant k uh, big k and small k and as well as a curie temperature so what is a d constant is actually the strain developed uh, over applied stress so 3 3 is actually the direction uh, of the uh, uh, these are the directions so 3 2 and 1 is actually referring to a uh, direction uh, of the force applied. So the strain applied, uh, developed uh, over applied stress is known as a D constant, while for a G constant is an open circuit field over applied stress or strain developed over applied charge density in whatever direction. So 3, 1, 1, 5 or 3, 3 uh, do not bother about that because it is just uh, the, dire the direction of the uh, strain applied. So how about the coupling coefficient k small k? Uh, it indicates uh, the the electromechanical coupling coefficient. This is uh, very important because this is uh, how we measure the how efficient the energy conversion has happened inside the piezoelectric materials because electro from electrical to a mechanical uh, uh, energy conversion and uh, dielectric constant k big k and uh, the how do we operate our sensors either in thickness mode or in transverse mode so uh, for a thickness mode we we, we have a parallel uh, way of uh, working and we also have a transverse way of uh, uh, transmitting okay so this is a thickness mode normally normally mostly uh, uh, underwater most underwater acoustic sensors are operating in thickness mode and yeah, don't ask uh, uh, the, the the answer why uh, why it is most uh, most of the sensors is working in the thickness mode the answers relies on the basic physics of why we why uh, we cannot uh, or why it is not so efficient to uh, the, for for the wave to propagate in a shear direction uh, on a liquid or uh, inside water. Okay, so in shear mode, we also uh, uh, the shear mode normally reserved for uh, non-destructive testing application only. It is for uh, NDT uh, testing mechanism. It is not for underwater uh, uh, applications. So normally for underwater applications, we are using thickness mode. Okay. So other modes, we have radial mode as well as wall transverse mode. This is not so important as well because we want to design uh, our sensors for underwater acoustics. So let's talk about the thickness mode. So uh, before that, we have uh, several other issues regarding vibration. Uh, of course, natural frequency of a simple spring system is related to spring constant and vibrating mass. However, our uh, sensor is not a simple spring system. It consists of several layers of material that might uh, uh, that might require uh, a more complex uh, a mathematical uh, equation uh, uh, to be understood uh, compared to a. Uh, it is not a simple spring system. So natural frequency of the device is related to the device stiffness matrix and mass matrix. So uh, both matrices is obtainable from a finite element analysis. So this is why nowadays uh, designers uh, started their uh, development cycle with finite element analysis or so-called computer simulation before proceeding into a fabrication. So previously, uh, including me, we just uh, Fabric, we just fabricate the sensors uh, and then we fine-tune the electronics, we fine-tune the, the, the materials using polishing methods, using uh, etching methods uh, to achieve the best or, or the desired operating frequencies. But it is not an efficient way, it is resourceful, it, it, it consumes a lot of resources energy, energy 
as well as time. So nowadays we have a very good mathematical modeling uh, inside a finite element analysis uh, software modules. So uh, we, we might need to change the way of work by starting our design process with finite element analysis first. So each vibration mode has a resonant and natural frequencies. Normally uh, for uh, an acoustic sensors, we, we are operating in a second or a third uh, uh, vibration modes. Okay. So finally, how do we develop our uh, sensors? Okay. Uh, so developing um, uh, underwater acoustic sensors, it depends on whatever resources we have, whatever resources available at our hand. But the process can be very tedious and it can be very simple, sim simple process. So uh, normally following the book, of course, it's all started with wigging out our material. We need to mill it, calcine firing at a, at a specific uh, temperature. It will involve uh, some, some sort of milling and drying as well as burning up. And finally, the sintering process will take place before we can go into machining and electroding process. And after electroding, then we can fire the electrode for a polling process. And after that, we have a final test inspection. And all this process alone is just to produce a PZT material. So simply put, uh, we can go through all this process if we have a very specific or demanding application for a normal underwater acoustic uh, applications i would like to suggest that we just uh, use uh, on the shelf pzt materials just buy it okay just buy it you can cut the the the, the development time uh, uh, very short yeah you can start building your transducers uh, from several months you can cut it short into several days so just buy your piezoelectric materials if it is available on the market. So how, choosing material, um, piezoelectric materials, again, we, you need to ask about what type of application you want to use. So the, the development always start with choosing the right frequency for your applications. So frequency will determine the propagation distance. Either it is a low frequency band or high frequency band or ultra high frequency band. So you must have a specific applications before start with a development process of your transducers okay and again attenuation the higher the frequency the higher the attenuation okay we, we, we don't want to uh, for example uh, 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 medical imaging applications uh, normally uh, in a range of 1.5 megahertz to 2 megahertz of operating frequencies however it is it is okay for that application because uh the 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 ultrasound uh only need to travel in less than uh a feet or maybe 30 35 centimeters but for uh for ocean or for maybe underwater uh, other underwater uh, applications you might need a lower frequency than that okay? because of we uh, for example as a pinger uh you uh, for a diver uh, the, the the sound generated by a pinger at least need to be travel for 200 300 meters uh, so that it can be detected by the uh, by the uh, boat uh, so it all depends on the application application will determine the frequencies so the frequency will determine the size of the transducers so the rule of thumb is the thickness is half of the wavelength over uh, two times frequency so then we can calculate the acoustic impedance of the transducers by using this simple equation. This is the density of your material and this is the speed of sound of inside the piezoelectric material. So after that, you can choose what type of uh, material that might be suitable for your application. So let's say we choose a PZT as an active material. So we know that the P inside the PZT, the C is 397 ohm meter per second the density will be 7500 kilogram per meter cube therefore the, the acoustic impedance for the pzt is uh, less than the 30 mega relay and the thickness required by using a previous equation we need a two centimeter thickness of uh, 
PZT. So, alright. After that, how to order? Uh, is it available on the shelf? If it is available, I strongly advise that you just get it on the shelf yeah, rather than uh, unless you are using a, a, you, you are very very particular with a operating frequencies or you have all the in-house facilities to fabricate your or to to uh, uh, your own uh, PZT materials. So uh, we have so many suppliers of uh, PZT materials nowadays because it is very particularly very 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 popular materials. So. Uh, we need a two centimeter of thickness. Here we have a diameter uh, of your uh, of your uh, of the piezoelectric materials. So just choose whatever uh, diameter and thickness uh, you might need. All right. So uh, and of course before ordering, we need to go through the material data sheets and inside the data sheets, you might find something familiar. Of course, the, the constant the G constant, uh, coupling coefficient, as well as others mechanical and thermal uh, properties inside the data sheet. So make sure uh, the, the all uh, the material properties are in line with your uh, application. And in this case, we are looking at a PZT 5A4E and the material is lead zirconite titanite. So this is a type 5A PZT materials so additional information uh, we might want to have a look at uh, a d constant at a different direction 3 3 and a 3 1 as well as the g constant 3 3 direction and 3 1 direction it carries a different numbers of uh, and values therefore it is important for you and for us to buy the right material for the right application even though we would like to take a, a shortcut we might need to be very particular on these numbers as well so next after choosing your piezoelectric materials uh, the next process is a wire bonding so wire, wire bonding process is simply uh, it can also be as simple as soldering or uh, uh, but uh, the, the, the only things that we need to uh, careful with is that to avoid the air area under constant mechanical stress. So we, normally we, we are not using uh, industrial wire bonder on the piezoelectric materials because of the surface roughness is not so good on the piezoelectric ceramics. So we uh, normally use a normal soldering method. So uh, the first thing you need to avoid is that uh, avoid uh, pushing the soldering tip uh, too hard on the uh, piezoelectric material as well as the angle of wire during soldering to the final position so also important and alternatively conductive epoxy can also be used for low curie temperature uh, material such as a PVDF because uh, we all know that PVDF has a, has a 100 degree Celsius curie temperature so it is almost impossible for you to solder uh, a wire on a PVDF. So these are the types of uh, uh, example of uh, soldering techniques that we are normally used on a piezoelectric uh, uh, material. This is acceptable. This is also acceptable. Uh, avoid using this angle because we want to put the normally we want to have uh, uh, another layer on top another layer at the bottom okay so avoid this one and avoid this one as well so normally we use this one okay because it is a lot more easier for us to fabricate and to uh, deposit other uh, additional layer on top of our piezoelectric material so next matching layers eh? all right matching layers is because uh, uh why do we need a matching layer now we have our pzt materials we have our water okay so this is our water this is our pzt the acoustic impedance of pzt and water uh, has a big difference so we you might need an additional layer over here before you can uh, transmit the sound efficiently so that, that this is why uh, a matching layer is very important so, uh, the, so uh, in this case, in this particular case, we have a huge difference in acoustic impedance between uh, PZT 
30 megarelli and a seawater at 1.5 megarelli. So matching layer must have acoustic impedance at, by using this equation, we need to find a material at 6.7 megarelli to be uh, in between PZT and a water. So looking at the material properties, okay, material, uh, we need to find the right material for a matching layer. So we have uh, several, uh, so, so many uh, uh, material options. And for materials that have acoustic impedance close to the calculated value, first we have a PVDF, a soft carbon, a tungsten loaded epoxy, and a pyrolytic carbon. So all this has a, a, a acoustic impedance between 4.2 megarelli and up to 7.3 megarelli. So let's say we choose a soft carbon at the speed of sound of 331 10 meter per second. So the thickness required. Again, we back to this equation. So we need the thickness of around 8.28 uh, millimeters of matching layers. In this case, soft carbon. Different material might yield or uh, might resulting in a different thickness. So it depends on whatever materials is available. And you, we also need to consider the type of uh, process that might need if you want to choose if we choose that particular materials so double matching layer sometimes we uh, a single matching layer is not enough we might need a second matching layer therefore you might need a different uh, equation all right so baking material as well so for now our sensors have a PZT material we have a baking layer first baking layer or maybe a second baking layer a second baking layer normally Oh, sorry, a uh, 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 matching layer. Normally, the second matching layer is a housing material for the sensors. Okay, uh, so this is the housing material of the sensor. This is the PZT. This is a matching layer one. This is a matching layer two. So matching layer two is a is your a housing material, as well as you might need a backing layer. Why do we need a backing layer? One reason, if we want to avoid pinging or ringing effect. Okay, uh, so ring effect is so important uh, because it will generate so much noise in a uh, produced sound. So normally, we might need a backing layer so that uh, the generated sound uh, to the back will either be absorbed or reflected to the front. So the, 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 all, all the generated sounds will be uh, generated at a specific direction and not all directions and uh, so the process is also the same okay. uh, uh, we can have a air back uh, we can also have a liquid back backing layer so it depends on what type of application normally normally uh, we use uh, a soft material uh, with a compressible structure such as rubber and wood chips as a baking layer because we just want to absorb whatever uh, produced a sound uh, uh, at the back direction okay uh, it is way simpler to just absorb the sound compared to the uh, reflected back the sound to the front it will produce more noise it will in incur uh, it will involve a more complex electronics uh, as well so for extreme depth uh, yeah, so, so your backing layer also uh, should be determined uh, should be chosen based on whatever operating depth you want to put your sensor at so solid backing layer let's see our 100 kilohertz projector will be deployed at 500 meter deep so z of our piezo uh, uh, material the, so this is the 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 the, the acoustic impedance of your piezo of our piezo is 30 megarelli so the best candidate for solid backing is cornell at 47.6 megarelli all right so the z uh, of the backing layer is 37.5 megarelli so for a bottom matching layer after uh, determine this, the, the acoustic impedance of your matching layer, next, of course, is to determine the thickness of your matching layer. Again, we are using the same formula, and we found that the thickness of the Cornell material should be at 1.1 centimeter thick. So finally, this is our transducers. This is our piezo, 
at the thickness of nearly 2 cm. This is our matching layer, first matching layer. Uh, this is a brush at a thickness of 1.1 cm. So the diameter of the structure must be at least 5 times piezo thickness. So if you have a piezo thickness of 1.985 cm, so the, the, uh, the diameter should be around 10 centimeter or greater so if less than centimeter structure is not in the thickness mode that's it so as simple as that we can design the uh, underwater acoustic transducers by uh, using the on the shelf material available nowadays even in shopee even in lazada nowadays you can buy a piezo disc material and you can start developing your own piezoelectric underwater acoustic transducers you can customize the the operating frequencies by manipulating uh, man, man, manipulating the thickness uh, of the matching layer of the backing layer as well as the housing and of course every sensor requires uh, electrical matching circuit so this is uh, fairly uh, simple and easy uh, we just uh, run the your, your sensor or your, your device using a uh, uh, acoustic impedance uh, sorry uh, using impedance uh, analyzer and find the best matching circuit for your sensor for your single element sensor and put that matching circuit to the uh, uh, to, to match with your whatever mechanical part you have been developed with so in short uh, And a final part of this uh, talk is about uh, uh, how do you calibrate your sensors. And, and of course, when talking about calibration, we have several standards that must be followed. Uh, uh, however, uh, the best way to calibrate your sensors is by, uh, uh, of course, uh, it depends on either you, 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 you uh, develop your sensors for uh, sound transmission or sound reception or for both eh? so for if you develop your sensors for projecting sound of course you need a reference uh, uh, transducers or reference sensors uh, in the form of um, a hydrophone if you want to uh, receive uh, you, 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 you design your sensors for receiver only you might need a, an array of uh, projectors eh, reference projectors so this these are the example of a simple setup to uh, calibrate your sensors so it is impossible for for us to follow all the guidelines and standards uh, uh, here in Malaysia because uh, the only standards underwater standards that we have uh, if we if you would like to uh, uh, commercialize your sensors uh, your underwater acoustic sensors you might need to send for a professional calibration services however you can still perform a simple calibration in your lab using this uh, simple setup you just you might need or you might require uh, maybe a, a two or three calibration hydrophone and, and uh, calibration projectors so that's it for me from me uh, so i hope this sharing will be beneficial uh, to every one of you and uh, developing an underwater acoustic sensors is not so difficult it is a very easy and very uh, interesting uh, field uh, so i would like to uh, thank you again uh, thanks again for the invitation for the opportunity and if you have any queries just give me a call uh, Put me uh, query anytime. Thank you again. Bye bye. Salam alaikum.